Hi, uh, I'm a designer, and I'm here to talk about the future of work. And to talk about this, I think we really start with the future of the workplace. And if we look at the classical idea of the workplace, it hasn't changed much at all. It's a place where we gather, we have the facilities of work, we have the opportunity to be together and work together, and not only for the sake of our employer, to be able to understand what we're up to, but to be able to work with each other. And if we look uh, at the past and we look at today, in terms of the workplace, not a lot has changed. And even when we look at all the different forms of work, and I think largely when we're talking about work, most of us in this room are probably thinking about work in that sort of, I work in an office kind of way. But uh, in a lot of the work I do, this is the form of work that we are trying to drive the future of because these people are dealing with, uh, in a lot of ways, much, many more sort of decisive moments uh, where the future uh, is more important to them. When it, you look at any of these cases of the future of work and the workplace, the biggest change agent has been, quite obviously, the PC. And maybe more intimately, the introduction of this version of computing. And beyond just the basic power of it, it's the fact that it is persistent and it's something we can't live without. It's something that's, of course, changing our day-to-day -day behavior. One of the most interesting parts about that, so we want to kind of build a little catalog of, of, of realities that are driving this possibility, is the fact that having this machine with us has made us all especially in the context of work, nodes in a network, right? We're all sort of addressable individuals now. Not something possible until this device. Uh, this is a, a project I worked on uh, for Disney, uh, Walt Disney World. If you go to Disney World, um, you wear a wristband that quite literally makes you a node in the park, something that the park can do. They can understand where you are and what you're doing, and of course it gives you uh, certain new capabilities. Another key factor is this sort of quantification of everything. We're using this ubiquitous presence of computing to quantify literally everything. Uh, and we'll get to some, I think, some really good examples. And lastly, the sort of th the, the third piece to this triumvirate is this idea of good enough AI. Now, you've probably sat through lots of discussions of AI, and I'm not going to add to that a lot, other than the basic idea that when I think about AI, when you think about it in the workplace, it's good enough that is most important. Not the idea of this sort of rich, rich intelligence that's possible, but AI that can simply add to intelligence. And Alan Turin, I think, said it best, intelligence is as intelligence does, meaning we don't need it to be really completely capable to be meaningful in what it means to work. Now, that leads me to sort of the title of this speech, Dark Interactions, because if you take those three pieces, you start to realize there's a layer to what it means to work together uh, that is new, and we don't really look at it a lot, but it is potentially the most transformative aspect of how, we'll, uh, how the workplace will change. So we're familiar, I think, consciously with the idea of bright interactions. We want to turn on the light, we turn on the light switch. And just as, as dull as that interaction is, most of our involvement in computing today is that way. We go to a computer and we send each other messages, we look up information, we're very much aware of what we're doing. Uh, we transact, and in fact, there's sort of an interesting little class that sort of rides this line of interactions where we're pressing buttons to open doors, um, kind of a nice little idea called volitional theater where uh, some of these actions happen with or without your uh, explicit involvement. But that leads me to this idea of dark interactions. And this is a new class of behaviors that really falls outside of purposeful human-to-machine interaction. Uh, one of the most interesting new examples of that is what's going on with Amazon. Now here is a store where moving around the store is a very much a tracked event. Everything you do in that store in terms of grabbing objects, moving around, uh, becomes part of that transaction with the space. That, to me, is one of the most bright examples of the future of work 
a future of how a workplace will evolve. And it's something that's deeply uh, driven by dark interactions. I'm going to use time as my friend here by moving a few, a few things. A couple of examples to sort of really illustrate this idea of dark interactions. These are all technologies that are really at the cusp of becoming readily accessible. Uh, we've talked about things like temperature sensors in buildings, but right at the edge of introducing to the market, there are sensors that understand your heartbeat, understand your breathing pattern, can pick out individuals in a room. Those sort of things are coming to the workplace. There are technologies that can read our emotional state by using radio waves uh, and a basic uh, form of AI to basically decipher how we feel. You can imagine instrumenting this sort of thing into an event where we're carrying out the ordinary office conversation and the tone of that conversation becomes a metric, becomes addressable. Now, I'm not going to tell you whether that's creepy or not. You can judge for yourself. But it's, again, one of those phenomena that's uh, right at the cusp of being introduced into the workplace. Basic positioning. We think of uh, GPS as sort of the, the idea of positioning, but positioning is becoming a very commonly uh, addressable thing even within the building. The idea of using, again, radio waves to position and identify where everybody is in the office. This one's a particular favorite of mine, on the conversation. I'm high Think about, and this is a I mean, particularly okay, uninteresting conversation that people are having in a conference room, but they have a machine there with them, Actually, and it's transcribing everything they say. We should hold off on doing a now, this is interesting in the case of a conference well, call, really sorry to interrupt, Dave, but I push that all the way through an office and connected. imagine that basic, what, okay, what's again a really clear I'll example of a dark interaction where you're just talking with a friend at the water cooler and, and imagine that as an addressable piece of data, something that's captured, transcribed, and available back to you. Now, I, as a designer, I would hope that that's something, if, if it's you and I that talk, that data is available only to you and I. But in terms of business policy, I can't predict uh, that not being something even uh, addressable outside of uh, our control. Overall, the idea of dark interactions is this complete embodiment of what we do and where we go within an office. So this is where I get interested in it. If that's the new layer of data, that's data beyond the sort of business style data that we have, what's possible? And a lot of the ideas so far, uh, when people talk about the future of how we might interface with each other in, in the office, they talk about things like VR. I don't really think that is going to be our common experience. But I do believe, I do believe we're at the cusp of introducing a lot of technologies that take this information, that take these relationships and these states that we exist in in the workplace and bring them to us in a heads up and aware mode. Now, the first set of technologies that we might imagine employing, they're not really socially acceptable. You're not going to wear this in the office, right? You, you feel like an idiot. Now, there are specialty jobs. If I'm a surgeon, this is going to make perfect sense to me. But you also have to understand how fast these technologies are evolving. This is a product that's likely to debut this year. It's a lot more socially acceptable. It's still on the sort of, I uh, feel a little weird wearing it. But this is another product that's in the lab from Intel. And this is completely acceptable. Now, this technology doesn't do as much as the latter two examples, but it is a matter of time. So I want to sort of build in this basic belief that the idea of heads up, idea of persistent knowledge, it, uh, persistent sight line addressable computing moments are in our future. And mixed with that dark data, we can start to imagine really incredible scenarios. So let me sort of paint a few of these scenarios. And these are all realistic prototypes. They're not all real tech yet, but I'm going to walk through quite a few. The basic idea here is we're talking about marking up the physical world. And one of the questions I want to answer here is, uh, I want to maybe open up, is, is this idea of where do we want to live and work? If we think about this sort of computing experience, that's not 
at all attractive. This is, but I want this kind of experience with the richness of the information that we want available. One of the ways that we can immediately make it addressable, so it's a particular technology that's interesting to me, is called interactive light. And this is sort of a bridge to that heads-up future. It is using the lights around us as not only just lighting, but information. Light is what's projected out of our screen, but it's very discreetly projected. It's an array of pixels. If you imagine that array of pixels being brought down to the average lighting, through very, very cheap, ubiquitous projection technology that is becoming cheap and accessible. We can imagine lots of beautiful scenarios. And they bring up really simple ideas, like how do we fit this level of information in our natural world into the workspace we already have? We have stuff on our desks, and now we have this virtual stuff on our desks. We've got to deal with that. And there's simple, this is a, a prototype of the basic algorithms. I'm going to show you a lot of things, and there's not always an explanation of each one, but just simply working, we're working through the problem. Really huge opportunity in the idea of cooperation, where we can work together in the same space. You all have used computing, uh, many of you, I'm sure, for maybe upwards of 30 years, at least the last 20. Um, but you all, I bet everyone's experience is quite a private experience. One of the things I really look forward to, this pr basically promises, is the idea of us gathering together in common spaces, common work environments, and being able to cooperate in what we do. It also offers a opportunity of deep context to tell us more about the sort of states we all work within. It allows us to do some magical things like reframe a lot of natural behavior where there are fixed facilities, but we can sort of invent facilities that we might want to have, invent controls. Here's a really simple example, reframing the idea of turning on and off lights, and even doing something as simple as adjusting the brightness of a light with an object we have near us. Really simple. Or taking a trash can and making it a tool for ordering or not ordering. If I throw it away in the red, I don't want it. If I put it in the green, I'm going to get another version of that. Um, also, some of the social ideas uh, of working at your desk, being able to say, I'm in a private state. And taking natural behaviors and turning those into little interface events. Maybe deep levels of decision support, especially when you think of yourself out in the field, if you're in construction, if you're in surgery, if you're in science, the information needs to be around you, but you're often working in these sort of very unstructured spaces. So we want to be able to put structured information in unstructured places and allow people to interact with it in natural ways with the objects that they have at hand. We also want to deliver information to people sort of in the time and in the place that it's most interesting to them and basically put it away when we're done with it. There's lots of beautiful examples of this. And lastly, uh, in terms of the examples, um, we tend to bring these things alive. When you start to add all these facilities, we start to think of these things as alive and really as part, as almost characters. It's just a, it's a human trait. Voice introduces the possibilities of making these interactions asymmetrical. When we think of interfaces, when we think of the computing moment, we think of it as this symmetrical exchange. Almost everything you do today feels like that. What's coming is a very asymmetrical world where there's maybe a thousand times more thing read in, but only the simplest little interface uh, for responding to that. And most beautifully, the opportunity to introduce very calm styles of interactions. Interactions that don't require that we fill our environment with ugliness like this, but instead more beautiful spaces where the digital information exists in the architecture that we enjoy. So the spaces, the objects around us, the workplace we live around us can be more magical, more beautiful. Okay, so I've got three minutes. Where are we headed with all of this? some things that are scary and some things that are nice. These are very exploitable systems. Oh, you missed it, the sound, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just tell you what it is. This was a TV commercial 
where this guy actually talked to your, your Google voice machine and forced it to start up a TV commercial, a, 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 a audio commercial. They basically exploited a personal system for an advertising purpose. Sort of an ugly product of modern technology. This is also, uh, we have not written rules, uh, especially in the US, around the public sphere. In fact, I was prepared to talk about this idea and only yesterday and the day before were this huge numbers of press articles about this technology going uh, public and being used by a lot of police departments to take common video feeds and identify people's faces in the public sphere. It's the dark side of what's possible. It also creates a real shift in our shared concepts of dependence. We learn to be dependent on systems that tell us uh, where to go. It also creates a sort of a, a doubt in our own cognitive ability to decide which way to drive somewhere or which decision to make, what to eat, uh, what to do at work. A sort of a blindness to why something happened. It also sort of injects thinking into our own natural thought processes. Uh, these are pieces of software that are out today where the answer to the conversation is presented for you. This was just demonstrated by Google last week, where as you type, it types potential sentences for you. This is a, a, a really big shift to how we might work together. Oh boy, do I have, no, I don't have time for this idea. <laughs> In quite simple, this, all of this information, this process of working together starts to draw a, do, a different version of us. We today live in this sort of separate versions of us where we've, we have a great deal of control over it. We can create this sort of ideal self online and we have our natural self. What's coming through all the things I showed you is a more combined self where we have much less control over defining it. In Facebook, we define ourselves, but in a world full of dark data, where our interactions define us, that version of us is much more of a whole singular thing. One of the simple design proposals I put out there for you guys is the idea that we need an invisibility switch. Years ago when the phone rang, it, only, it, it rang out loud and we couldn't turn it off. But when we all ended up with phones, we ended up with a mute switch because it's absolutely necessary. In tomorrow's world, where this information is available, when we're trackable everywhere, we need an invisibility switch on our phones, on the devices around us. And that, to, for me, is some of the key ideas of the future of work. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your time.